We are going to get underway immediately as our topic is building a finance system fit for a clean, resilient, and just future. Needless to say, we've already agreed this morning that this is a challenge. So my question to you, Anushka, from HSBC, how is it that your bank is answering the call of um, the uh, COP26 as well as the other directives that are coming from investors. What are some of the specifics that you are leading with to address climate? Absolutely, Claudine. Well, thank you for having me and, and thank you for the question. Look, I think I'll start by saying that I think financial institutions can and have a huge responsibility in helping to drive towards a more sustainable and inclusive future. And I think there are a number of ways in which they can demonstrate this. The way I think about it is sort of in, in three buckets, if you will. So, you know, the first is outlining your own ambitious targets, right? To demonstrate that you're on this journey as well. You're practicing what you preach and that you're looking to be sort of ambitious and meaningful around what you're doing. I think the second one where financial institutions can really play a role is helping to drive industry standards and, and global policy as well where appropriate. Um, and that kind of helps to create markets and helps sort of scale markets as well. And then the third, which I think is arguably the most important, is thinking about how this is built into our business lines and how we are supporting our clients on their transition and their journey to a more sustainable and inclusive future. So in terms of what has HSBC done in those sort of three buckets, then I suppose is the question. So sort of bucket one in terms of our own, our own commitments, we anchor our climate ambitions around sort of three key pillars. The first is becoming a net zero bank ourselves. So by 2030 in our own operations, and as I say, arguably more importantly, by 2050 in our financed emissions. So those are the emissions and the financed emissions around the capital we're deploying with our clients. The second pillar of it is around sort of deploying um, capital and scaling fi uh, sustainable finance markets. So we've committed up to a trillion dollars in sustainable finance, and we look to be a trusted partner to our clients as they look to access these markets and, and look sort of scale their ambitions. And then the third pillar of it is around unlocking climate and, and innovative solutions. So really thinking about the cutting edge, if you will, of, of the solutions and the technologies we are going to need to be able to reach that net zero future. In terms of sort of the, the middle bucket that I mentioned, yes. you know, we, we've been part of a number of sort of industry bodies. You know, we are a founding member, for example, of the Net Zero Banking Alliance, amongst others, where again, we're trying to help sort of drive and support industry standards to help scale these markets. And then sort of the third piece, which I think links back to that financing piece that I mentioned, that trillion dollars, you know, it is sort of part and parcel. And this is kind of the part that I, I'm most involved with is supporting our clients, right, and helping to build those markets. So thinking about sort of sustainable bond markets, sustainable lo loan markets, thinking about supply chains and other innovative financial solutions that we can help to deploy to start driving towards a more sustainable future. Okay. So... I and probably a number of other people got this slipped under your door this morning. And uh, these are two entities that are part of the Net Zero Banking Alliance. And so there's great question. It's one thing to say, and once again, we get back to that issue of greenwashing, but elaborate a little bit about your loan program at HSBC. Are you still loaning funds to the fossil fuel industry or have you stopped it or phasing out or where are you on that now? Yeah, it's, it's a great question. And look, I think it's worth taking a step back to think about the sustainable finance um, arena more broadly, right? So if you think about sustainable finance, be that across bonds and loans, we have seen extraordinary growth in that market over the last five to 10 years. You know, I think the bond market was really sort of the first frontier, if you will, when you think about sustainable finance. You know, going back to sort of the late 2000s, I think it was a very niche market, right, where you saw just public sector entities coming to the market. And last year, I believe it was sort of 10% of the global bond market um, it, it, as a collective, which is extraordinary when you think about the amount that that's grown over time. We've seen the same happen with loans as well, I think, you know, slightly later on, but again, we're still seeing that type of growth. And I think the other piece, and this kind of comes to the question that you, that you asked, is we're also seeing the development of different types of instruments. So, you know, historically we saw what were called use of proceeds instruments, which is where you have, you know, a very clearly defined 
uh, set of eligible assets for which the proceeds are, are meant to, to finance. We're now seeing the development of what's called the sustainability linked market. And so that's basically not tying your proceeds to any specific assets, but basically tying you know, the coupon or the interest you're paying, depending on whether it's a bond or a loan, to achieving your global and group sustainability targets. And what that means is that a number of clients and a number of organizations are now able to access sustainable finance markets, perhaps those that didn't feel they had the right eligible assets, weren't able to track them over time. But you're now seeing more of these sectors who are perhaps you know, on the slightly more difficult end of sustainability, being able to access these markets and showing that they're sort of practicing what they preach and are trying to make progress in the right direction. And that is exactly the type of you know, business that we're looking to do as well, right? In terms of supporting our clients on this journey, helping them to think about what the right type of finance is, how to set the right targets, how to ensure they've got long-term and short-term targets, and ensuring that we're using sustainable finance to help them get that. And that's across all client types at this point in time. But we certainly have a number of different targets for ourselves outlined now around, as I said, our financed emissions. We have very clear goals around sort of oil and gas, power and utilities, and coal now ourselves, and look to expand that over time too. Okay, great. Well, Jamin, many may not know about One Trust, and I know as a company you started off in the data security arena and have morphed into ESG. I wonder if you could elaborate a little bit about how the financial community can be more of a leader and the role that you're playing. Yeah, absolutely. So when we think about the financial community and the context of governance within ESG, even though we've kind of heard from the SEC earlier and other regulatory bodies that are really driving the disclosures, a majority of the reason organizations started focusing on ESG was because of investor uh, pressure. And it was an expectation not only of the investment firms and the financial firms, but also of the consumers, whether it was B2B or B2C, even if you're affiliated with a third party that you utilize, the context of ESG now started getting governed by everyday people just like us. So when we start thinking about that governance and ESG, we started out on the data privacy, data security side, even within privacy, it was the same context. Within EMEA especially, the expectation of the everyday consumer was that organizations were ethically using that data and they were using it for the perspective or the reason they initially mentioned and captured it. And when we think about ESG, it's the same expectation of the consumer. And when we think about programs, yes, you can start setting your net zero targets. Yes, you can start putting out your code of conduct in terms of what your organization uh, practices or at least preaches. But then in order to actually demonstrate that level of accountability and create that level of transparency to actually have the governance, that's where we kind of focus in on actually operationalizing programs that help you then define those targets and metrics and actually report on those targets and metrics for your own internal performance as a financial institution, but also then to be able to translate that both internally and externally across that full consumer base. And so, Anushka, are you finding some um, engagement on the part of investors that relate to what Jamin just shared with us? Absolutely. Look, I think it, it's clear that investors are taking a much more active stance around ESG, and, and that's across the ESG spectrum, right? Be that around climate, be that around diversity and inclusion more recently, and I think that's only going to continue, especially as policymakers start to also take a more active stance and start sort of relay more than investors need to be doing in the space. So, look, I think, you know, to answer that question succinctly, the answer is absolutely yes, and I think that's only going to kind of continue to grow with intensity over time. So we've talked to some degree about policy, specifically with the SEC, but having served in the US Congress for 10 years, many people are not acutely aware that we're not only dealing with the existential crises of climate, but also the existential crises of our democracy. And when we talk about ESG, at this moment in time, much of the emphasis has been on the E, and then perhaps next on the S. But in terms of governance, what, for example, is One Trust looking at as you look at the data on governance? Yeah, so when we think about the governance, as I kind of mentioned, if it's based off of not just the consumer, but think about your hiring practices now. Or think about the interviews that you have and what some of the questions that are being asked by the talent pool when you're in those interviews. It's no longer just, oh, what are like the responsibilities? What do I do on a day-to-day -day basis, et cetera? It's, no. What is your code of conduct? What are your practices when it comes to diversity? What are your diversity targets, both from a board and overall employee perspective? And what are you doing to kind of work towards those? 
those are the questions that we start to get in interviews regardless of whether we're hiring for ESG or any other role within the organization. And every kind of all hands that we do as a company, those are usually the first sets of questions that come up too. So when it goes back to the governance, the governance isn't necessarily driven by these regulatory bodies that are coming to us and saying, hey, OneTrust, show us these metrics now and kind of create those disclosures. But it's what our everyday employees are asking. It's what I'm asking of our board. It's what every kind of individual that we're looking to hire is asking during the interview process. And for a lot of you, you're probably also getting these exact same questions from the businesses if you are a B2B company on their onboarding process. So the governance has been put into the hands and you kind of asked earlier, like what does the financial sector play in that role? Investors now go ahead and dictate what your overall multiplier is in terms of evaluations based off of some of your ESG metrics, which is wild because they measure in the same way they measure financial performances. What's your ESG performance and how does that impact the evaluation that we give you as an organization? So to answer your original question around yeah. governance, rather yeah. than it being regulatory driven, yeah. what we've seen really evolve over the course of the past year is it's driven by employees, consumers, and also the other businesses that you look to work with. And investors, because and investors, one yeah. of the uh, shareholder resolutions that are becoming more frequent are what is this corporation contributing toward the lobbying effort? Um, Where are the political contributions going? And at this moment in time, many of the corporations in this audience are currently contributing to the 200 seditionists that have been identified as trying to bring down the U.S. government. So needless to say, the G of the ESG is critically important at this moment in time. The other thing I wanted us to touch on is the standardization of the data that is being collected and the push for that. And what do you see could be the best thing that HSBC could be doing now in terms of pushing for standardization? I think this kind of comes back to to the initial point right around the role that financial institutions can play in in these markets. And I think a big piece of it is around sort of helping to support and drive those industry standards. So, you know, if you go back to a number of years when you think about, you know, the green bond principles, you think about, you know, more recently the sustainability linked loan and bond principles, you know, financial institutions have played a big role to help support the, the, the development of those types of standards. And I think the same is probably true here around you know, be that ratings, ESG ratings, be that data. And again, I think there's a big role that we can play to help sort of create clarity around sort of what investors are looking for um, and help sort of drive those standards. Again, a lot of this, I think, will be driven by policymakers, as you say, Claudine, right over time, we've seen the SEC and we heard earlier today around some of the disclosure requirements they're going to have. We're seeing a huge amount come out from the EU as well. So, you know, as you start to see policymakers take a more active stance, I think there will be a trickle down effect as to sort of how we start to see more aggregation around data and standardization as a result. So d- how, Jamin, have you, has one trust focused on consistency in terms of data collection and reporting? Yeah, absolutely. So um, to Anushka's point, we also saw this in Europe with the German Supply Chain Due Diligence Act that now requires disclosures across your full supply mm-hmm. chain. The EU directive essentially then said, let's just go ahead and copy, not verbatim, but essentially in terms of all the requirements, But at the same time, if you look at a lot of those regulations, they keep all of the actual requirements high level. They don't actually define the specific metrics that you then need to be able to capture Uh when it comes to those respective disclosures. And within the SEC, at least they kind of reference TCFD as kind of the metrics-based approach to take. But what we'll see is what we saw across the privacy space, which was when CCPA prior uh, kind of passed in California, Most institutions said, let's figure out some standardization because we're global organizations. I have to report on something different for California. I have to report on something different for EMEA. Crazy. We need some standardization. (laughs) At the end of the day, a lot of the actual metrics that you're capturing translate across each of these different standards and frameworks. And as these policymakers continue to develop uh, additional components, they all go back to the same data points that you're capturing. Uh, So what we've really focused on is, okay, let's figure out what are the data points that actually go into each of these different industry standards and frameworks, and how similar are they to, as long as you do the data capture, you can easily translate it uh, Hmm. based off of each of the respective disclosure requirements. Uh, That's just the approach that we've taken, but to your point, we'll see more and more policymakers drive what those respective metrics are. And it just goes back to making sure that you're operationalizing the actual data collection, so that way your program scales regardless of what the disclosure requirements are.
Do you feel that the financial community is moving rapidly enough since you are part of a number of different collective banking financial institutions? So it's a tricky one. Like I think the answer to that <laughs> um, conveniently is yes and no, right? In that okay. I think yes, it's, you know, I think certainly before my own eyes, I've kind of seen things change rapidly in the last few years, right? For this, from this being sort of a, a more peripheral topic, sort of being mainstream, part of our business lines and, and how we're looking to sort of, you know, drive discussions with our clients. Um, but at the end of the day, when you think about a, a, a pathway to net zero, a path, pathway to that all important 1.5 degree number, we're not there yet, right? Like that, that's right. the bottom line. And at the end of the day, it's going to take collaborators across industries, across geographies, um, across regions, across a number of different facets in order to band together and actually push for progress, right? But so all of that to say, yes, I've seen a huge amount of change, but as we all know, we're not there yet and there's still a huge amount that we need to do to put our foot on the accelerator to get there. So Jamin, if you had a magic wand and you could move this industry more rapidly, what would be the two actions that you would wave your wand over? <laughs> Oh, wow. Um, I think number one and the most challenging that we think that we see with organizations is just understanding where they are mm -hmm. in terms of if we just think about sustainability okay. of their carbon footprint. Uh, it seems like, great, we want to get to net zero, but the number one challenge that most organizations have is where what are, is our we? Actual, exactly, where <laughs> are we? So if there was a magic wand that just said, here's your exact carbon footprint and here's everything that contributed to your carbon footprint mm -hmm. without actually going through the exercise of all of that data collection to get there, that'd probably be number one. Okay. Uh, the second component of that, again, thinking about it from the context of sustainability, would then be kind of those reduction strategies. Yeah. And at least, I don't want to say it's easy, but it's easier uh, compared to the actual accounting, because at least once you have the accounting in terms of your footprint, you know where each of those emissions are coming from to where your organization can focus on those reductions mm -hmm. uh, to kind of move towards that net zero outside of just focusing on offsets. So that would probably be the second step uh, after the initial accounting. Awesome. Would if you I be? Could, uh, yes. I was going to say, if I, could, if I could build on that Please. as well, I couldn't agree with you more, Jamin. And I think what, you know, what, what is great to see is I think organizations starting to think more about what is material to their business operations, right? right? When you think about ESG, the spectrum is vast, right? There are so many different things that you can be thinking about. But I think the best place to start is really thinking about your business operations and thinking of the opportunities and the risks when you think about it with an ESG lens. And I think that's a really good starting point, even with you know conversations with investors, for example, right? If you can sit in front of them and say, here are our business operations, and here's where we see the opportunities and risks, and here is where we're starting, and here's how we've prioritized, I think that's a really good place to start. And from there, you can start to set you know, targets, be that long-term targets, but also short and medium-term targets to make sure that you're on that sort of path, that glide path, if you will, to, to, to success but also making sure that you then have the right governance to your point, Claudine, right? And structures and infrastructure in place to ensure that you have the right disclosures and that you have the right people in place to ensure that there's the right accountability to get to where you need to go to. So I'd say thinking about materiality and what is really important to your business is also a great place to start. And transparency has to be the big overlay. Transparency was mentioned many times this morning, but it is absolutely essential to achieve those suggestions that the two of you have shared. So I have been getting signals that it is time for lunch. So I hope there are no other pressing questions. If there are, I think we could um, honor one or two. Maybe raise your hand. No, I think we're good. Well, thank you, panel, very much for your input and for your attendance. You guys were awesome. Thank you as well. <laughs>